What's So Great About God with Dinesh D'Souza and Christopher Hitchens. Dinesh D'Souza is a native of India who has lived in America for 30 years and now resides in California. He graduated from Dartmouth in 1983 and served as policy analyst in the Reagan White House. He considers himself a rebel against extreme secularism and claims that Christianity is winning the battle with secularism and that atheism is on its way out. Christopher Hitchens was born in England and is now a U.S. citizen, having lived here for more than 25 years. Mr. Hitchens is an author, journalist, and literary critic. His education began early under the tutelage of Ms. Watts in Dartmoor and continued with a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics. Mr. D'Souza will begin the debate with a 15-minute opening statement, followed by Mr. Hitchens doing the same. Thank you, um, Dr. Bishop. That was a um, very gracious uh, introduction. In fact, I think I might have been the only guy sitting up here going, more, more, more. Um, I am um, very pleased and honored to be here. I um, must say that I love the South, uh, and I mean that in more ways than one. My, my wife is from Louisiana, and uh, her name is Dixie. Um, we, we now live in San Diego, and many people don't think that's a real name. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here in Mississippi, delighted to be um, crossing swords again with uh, Christopher Hitchens and addressing the topic of what is so great about God. Now, here in the Bible Belt, you might feel that this is the uh, Christian capital, you might say, of the world, uh, but actually it is not so. Uh, it's, um, if you want a capital for Christianity in the world, you're probably better to look at Seoul, South Korea, or you're probably better to look at uh, a village in Nigeria. Uh, or a favela in Brazil. The point I want to make here, and it's actually a very encouraging point for those of us who are religious believers, uh, is that religion in general, but specifically Christianity, is spreading rapidly throughout the world. In fact, many people think Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, but it's not true. Islam is the second fastest growing. Uh, the fastest growing is Christianity. Uh, Islam spreads mainly through reproduction, Muslims having big families. But Christianity spreads through reproduction and conversion. Now, this is a big surprise because just a couple of decades ago, when I was in college, we learned that the world is becoming inevitably more secular. There's a kind of inexorable tide away from belief in God and toward what the philosopher Nietzsche called the death of God, a completely secular society. And the idea was that as countries become more modern, uh, more industrial, more scientific, more affluent, they will automatically become less religious. This was called the secularization thesis, or the secularization expectation. And the interesting thing is it has turned out not to be true. In fact... The only example of secularization that we can point to in a clear way is Europe. It's true, as Europe became more affluent, it did become more secular. But America hasn't gone the way of Europe. And in fact, if you look at the newly modernizing countries of India and China, uh, you find that far from becoming less religious, they're becoming more religious. And in fact, Christianity is spreading very rapidly in countries where it previously had no footing at all. You have African countries that were 1% or 2% Christian 100 years ago, and now they are 50% Christian. So why am I telling you all this? Because it seems to me that one reason we are seeing this new atheism, a kind of attack against God, an attack against Christianity, is not because Christianity is losing, but because it is winning. 25 years ago, the atheists thought we can sit back on our rocking chairs and just wait the world is going to move in our direction, but now they've realized that's not happening. We've got a counterattack. And so I think the belligerency of these books, the God delusion, God is not great, are a reflection of the fact 
uh, that atheism has got to, you might say, go evangelical. And what I mean by that is we now have a new phenomenon in our time. You could call it missionary atheism. The atheist actually wants to get out there and make converts to his or her cause. Now, what's my complaint about, the, about all this? First of all, I want to say that in this debate, my idea is to defend Christianity, but without appealing to any Christian premises. In other words, I'm not going to be citing the Bible I'm not going to appeal to revelation. You might almost say I'm going to debate with one hand tied behind my back. But why? Because ultimately I want to engage the secular critique on its own ground, which is on the ground of reason. So our debate will be conducted by discussing history and philosophy and science and politics. But at no point am I going to appeal to any kind of Christian revelation. I'm going to appeal, as Christopher Hitchens claims to, uh, on the ground of reason alone. And one of the complaints I want to make is that the atheist today is ignoring, is actually neglecting the huge influence of God, but specifically the Christian God, in shaping the values of our society, even the values that the atheists care about. Let's set aside for a moment Christian values. Let's just look at atheist values, values like the idea of the individual or the right to dissent. Uh, or uh, the idea of toleration, or the equal dignity of women, or the idea of compassion as an important social value, the, the, the dignity of life, and so on. The importance of science, which a lot of atheists will champion as their cause. The point I want to make is that these values have assumed the importance that they have in the West, and in fact, in some cases, in the world, because of Christianity. Uh, take, for example, the ideas behind the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, and out of that comes this entire catalog of rights. And yet Jefferson, who was not a particularly devout Christian, Jefferson never read, generally tended to read his Bible with a friendly pair of scissors, cutting out passages that he didn't like so much and so on. Didn't like the miracles. But on the other hand, when Jefferson sat down to identify the source of our rights, where do these rights, they're supposed to be self-evident, some people might say they're not evident at all. Where do these rights come from? Jefferson could think of only one source, namely our creator. Ultimately, it is because we are created equal, you may say, in the eyes of God, that's why it follows that no man has the right to rule another man without his consent. That is not only the basis for opposing slavery, the anti-slavery movement, but you might say it's also the basis of democracy. Modern democracy is based on the idea of what? No man or no person has the right to rule another without consent. Not only have our political ideas not only do they derive from Christianity, from Jerusalem, you might say, Christianity, and in some cases Judaism before that, but even science has its roots in Christianity. Now, some people will dispute this, but if you think about it, ask yourself this question. We've had all these cultures in the world, and yet modern science, the scientific method, what Whitehead called the invention of invention, that occurred only in one civilization, namely Western civilization. In fact, it occurred only in the civilization historically called Christendom. Why is that? Why did science develop here? Aren't there smart people in other cultures who also wanted to figure out stuff? The truth of it is, science developed in Western civilization because it is based on a Christian assumption. And what is that Christian assumption? It's the assumption that nature, or the universe, is intelligible. In other words, that nature follows predictable laws. Now you might say, well, that's kind of obvious, that's what science is based on. But if you think about it, it's not obvious at all. Why should nature be lawful? In Christianity, the idea is that we have an omniscient, or all-knowing God. So yes, he made a rational universe. We have God who is a lawgiver. He gave us the Ten Commandments, the moral law. So it's not surprising he gave us the laws of nature. But my point is, in some senses, the intelligibility of the universe is a kind of mystery. Let me give you an example of what I'm getting at here. 
It is a key, one of the central laws of science that light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles a second in a vacuum. That's one of the central laws of science. And yet, in some level, if you think about it, you say, well, how do we know that? We can measure the speed of light. You can measure it one time or ten times or a million times. Who cares? How do you know that on, in a galaxy ten light years away, light travels over there at that speed? Has anybody measured it over there? No. We're simply guessing that because light is measured traveling at a certain speed over here, it must travel at the same speed over there. And not only that, but we assume that light that travels uh, 10,000 years ago or even 5 billion years ago, light also traveled at the same speed, although there's absolutely no way to verify that. So how do we know that? We're assuming a lawful cosmos. Now again, when you go to other cultures, you see right away how this assumption is immediately called into question. The great Muslim thinker Al-Ghazali says, human beings can follow laws, if you're driving on a street, you see a stop sign, you stop. But that's because we are intentional and purposeful agents. He says, how can inanimate objects follow laws? How can an electron know what to do? And Al-Ghazali says, the whole universe exists in the mind of Allah. Everything happens at every second because Allah wills it to be so. There's no other way it can happen. The point I'm trying to get at here is to show that it is only in Western civilization, it's only in the orbit of Christianity, that we have this idea of a rational, intelligible, lawful, mathematical universe. And while people often talk about science as opposed to Christianity, if you were to make a list of all the great scientists of the last 300 years, a list that would surely include people like Galileo, and Copernicus, and Kepler, and Leibniz, and Pascal, and Boyle, and Newton, you'll discover that the vast, vast majority of these scientists not only believed in God, but most of them were specifically Christian. So Christianity, in a sense, is the author, not only of many secular values, but also of the science that is today invoked against Christianity. I've spoken a little bit about the legacy of Christianity. I need to, I need to, I have a lot of material to cover and my time is so limited. So I, I need to adopt the motto that King Henry VIII used with one of his wives. He said, I can't keep you too long. So, so I need to, I need to fast forward a little bit. And now I want to talk, if I may, briefly about morality. And I want to try to show, I want to try to show that one of the things that's great about God is God ultimately is the moral lawgiver of the universe. The first thing I want to show is that morality is universal. This is very obvious. We all have, if you, if you can. By the way, some people think we get our morality from the Bible. But that's not strictly true. I tried to remind myself when I first read the Ten Commandments. Did I read the Ten Commandments and say... Oh, let me see. Stealing is wrong. Wow, unbelievable. I had absolutely no idea. Killing is wrong. That's another big surprise. No, the truth of it is when I read the Ten Commandments, I already knew them. I already knew the Ten Commandments is not an inventor of morality. It's a codification of it. Really, morality is the voice within. What Adam Smith calls the impartial spectator inside of us. And all of us have morality. I was speaking on the campus the other day. I said, you know, look, if we were to bring a little dog into this room and, and Christopher Hitchens were to get up and start stomping on it, there would be a tremendous wave of revulsion throughout the room. And someone in the audience shouted, well, what if it's a cat? I said, well, then we'd all be equally entertained. Uh, but nevertheless, the point is, the point is when we acknowledge when we acknowledge within us the existence of a moral law, remember that law cannot come from nature. And here's why. Nature is simply a description of what is the case. Nature is a description of reality as it is. Morality is a description of reality as it ought to be. And that's two very different planes of existence. The way things are, and the way things ought to be. 
Nature supplies the former, but it does not supply the latter. So what is the source of morality? Where do we get this little voice of conscience inside ourselves that seems to speak with unimpeachable authority? I mean, we can dispute our, con- we can dispute our conscience. One of my friends says, I'm always wrestling with my conscience and I usually win. But what he's trying to say is my conscience is an acknowledged authority. I might not go along with it, but I don't dispute the the unimpeachable power of what it has to say. And my point is, what is its source? I think it makes more sense to think of conscience as transcendent, which is having, you might say, a non-natural or, I would say, supernatural source, than to try to account for it in natural terms, which is simply to confuse the way things are with the way things ought to be. And I want to turn to um, an argument for the existence of God and for belief in God that I think we would do well to consider, particularly if we are not strong atheists, but you might say sitting on the fence. Or we're Christians, but we're not really sure why we believe what we do, whether it makes sense. I want to, I want to conclude with an argument that was raised by the philosopher Pascal. And Pascal makes the point, how am I doing on time? Fine. Pascal makes the point that in life, we have to make decisions even though we don't always have full information. Years ago, when I got engaged to my wife, I said to myself, I don't think I should um, give her the ring. Why? Because I'm really not sure what life with this girl is going to be like for the next 40 years. I don't know. I'm an agnostic. So what I should do is wait. I should wait for the data to come in. But then I realize even if we date for another year or five years, I still won't know. I believe believe your time is up, Mr. D'Souza. I'll pick this up in my rebuttal. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, for coming. Um, I'd like to exempt myself from the chairman's kind offer of protection. Uh, You don't have to demonstrate southern courtesy to me. I've had enough of it uh, all day. Um, Everyone's been almost stupefyingly uh, polite and gentle with me. So if anyone wants to get rough, they might find that I was ready to play. Um, Second, I want to uh, explain a little riddle in the introduction uh, about Mrs. Watts, my first and in many ways my best teacher when I was nine. She was my nature teacher in a lovely little school in the west of England. She was also my scripture teacher. So she would take us on nature walks, show us the beauties. Then she would do us, uh, search the gospels. And everything would have been fine if this lovely lady hadn't overreached one day and tried to combine her two roles, tried to fuse them, and on a nature walk say to us, look children, how beautiful and green all the vegetation is, the trees, the grass, the leaves, and how good that makes God, doesn't it? How, how kind also it makes him, as well as how powerful. Green is the color most restful to our eyes. And God could have made it mauve or orange or purple if he'd wanted to. And there'd have been a terrible clash and wouldn't have been so comfortable. And I was nine. And I knew nothing about chlorophyll or photosynthesis or evolution by natural selection or any of these things. But I remember thinking, that's nonsense. Um, The eyes have adapted to the environment, not the environment to the eyes. And from that moment onwards, I've been able to see through all arguments from design, however subtly they're put or by however however clever a person. Um, Now, the subtitle of my book is that religion poisons everything. And some people come up to me and say, or ask me at meetings like this, come on, you know, lighten up. Can you be serious? Everything? Do you really mean everything? I mean, Italian cooking, fried green tomatoes... Chess, tantric sex, whatever. And yes, as a matter of fact, I do mean to say this because 
I think that the religious cult, the, the impulse to worship, in other words, the impulse to uh, displace ourselves onto a higher and unalterable authority, in some way attacks us in our very deepest integrity, and it threatens to take away from us what is our most precious as well as our most uh, worrying and anxiety-making thing, which is our, our need for responsibility, our need to accept it for ourselves, and our wish to be free, uh, contrasted with our wish very fre frequently and very um, noticeably expressed, our wish to avoid responsibility, and our fear of being free. And it's the latter two things, it seems to me, that religion caters for. We're offered in religion the chance to have our sins not just forgiven, but taken away from us altogether. We're offered the chance to throw them on somebody else. We're offered what I consider to be the, the horrible and rather immoral doctrine of vicarious redemption, whereby it's as if you never sinned in the first place. It's not like having your debts paid. It's not like having wasted time made up for you. It's, it's as if you've been cleansed, as if you never did it. This is, um, this is a, an absurd abandonment of responsibility, in, and it takes the form, an unpleasant form, well known to the, the peasants of antiquity, of scapegoating. You simply throw it all onto another party and make that party, sometimes an animal, sometimes a human sacrifice, bear these sins away. Out of this kind of ritual and out of this kind of negation of responsibility, it seems to me, we have to grow. So that's the, that's the first point. It, it denies us our moral autonomy. It is said that we need God for morality, or perhaps I, I shouldn't caricature my opponent's position. It is said that without some appeal to the divine, to religion, we would not ourselves be able to tell a right action. We wouldn't know how to ground ourselves ethically. We wouldn't know right from wrong. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know precisely how uh, to make the distinctions. I believe the contrary is the case. I believe that my mother's ancestors, if they ever did really spend all that time getting to Mount Sinai, which I think is, by the way, a mythical story, but never mind, let's take it as true for now, would not have got there and would not have got that far if they'd been under the pre-existing impression that adultery, perjury, murder, and theft were all fine. Um, it's rather from religion, from us, excuse me, from, from human solidarity, from the knowledge that all societies have, that they cannot possibly evolve if they countenance murder or perjury or theft. That religion takes its morality. The stuff that's in the Ten Commandments, Dinesh, um, that isn't to do with human morality is often highly immoral. For example, it's forbidden even to covet uh, other people's goods or achievements. And by the way, among their goods are included their wives, their women folk who are lumped in with chattel, which goes to show that these commandments are created by men and not by gods. They're created by the agricultural and, and masculine values of the time. It's not a small point. But there's nothing, uh, for example, to condemn the abuse of children. There's only a vague demand that parents be respected. After all, this is coming from, apparently, a father. There's nothing against racism. There's nothing against slavery. There's nothing against genocide. Partly because in these and ensuing chapters, all those things, racism, genocide, slavery, are actually going to be not just recommended, but enjoined, made an actual injunction on the children of Israel. They're going to be told to do these things. Uh, so... It seems to me very obvious that, the, that what is known as religious morality is partly man-made, and it shows. It shows that it's made by a, a greedy and cruel, partly evolved, fairly highly evolved, let's not run ourselves down too much, primate species that turns out on examination to be, as we now know, one half chromosome away from a chimpanzee. Well, the other objection, and it, it comes out of this one, is that um, religion gives us a false picture of moral reality. If it were true that religion was, a, was the source of morals and ethics, then you'd have to be able to answer the following two questions that I'm going to pose to you, and take your time to answer them. We have plenty of time to discuss this when we move to the, the, the public phase of this evening. Um, you have to name for me a moral action committed or an ethical statement made by a believing person, by a person of faith, that I couldn't make as an unbeliever. Okay? I've challenged the Archbishop of Canterbury on this in public and many other spokesmen of many religions. I've not yet had 
a persuasive answer. You have, you have time. Think of something I can't do that's moral or I can't say that's moral or ethical because I'm not a believer. Take your time. Now there's a corollary question. Think of a wicked thing done, a wicked thing done, or an evil thing said by somebody purely because they are a person of faith. You've already thought of one. You don't need any prompting from me. The suicide murder community is almost entirely faith-based. The, the genital mutilation of children is, is exclusively religiously motivated. Things that, sins that hadn't been thought of before, things that have, we've hardly had time to think of condemning, are actually advocated uh, by men of God and often in the name of God as a matter of obedience to his will. So just bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, if you do want things to get a little warm later on, that I, for one, will take it as extremely insulting if any person of faith makes the assumption that their faith gives them a moral edge on me. I want to hear a lot more apologizing from the faith-based communities for the evil that they've done before they even start clearing their throats and telling me I wouldn't know right from wrong without their permission. I'm sorry, I won't be, can't be spoken to in that tone of voice and nor should any of you. On with the false picture of reality. Religion has its grandeur, the reason why this discussion is always so interesting, always so worth having. The magnificence of religion comes from the fact that it was first. It was our first attempt. It was our first attempt to make sense of the cosmos, our first cosmology, our first attempt at philosophy. In many ways, and in some of the books, our first attempt at literature and, and poetry. Um, in some ways, our first attempt at, at, at medicine, even at physics, uh, at all the sciences and some of the arts, this was humanity's first fumbling attempt to look at the sky and see uh, where it fitted in. Uh, all credit to religion for trying this. Someone had to. Um, but it, because it was the first, it was also, is also in many ways the worst. What happens when you don't have a germ theory of disease and you wonder where the plagues are coming from? Well, you either think they're a punishment from God or you think, depending on how far we've gone along into the medieval years of religion, they come from the Jews poisoning the wells, or from witchcraft, or from people not going to their prayers enough. The same about natural phenomena, like earthquakes or floods. Um, there must be a supernatural explanation for things that, of course, we now know, uh, can be much better and more accurately explained for us. So the fact that we are still burdened by the false picture given of reality and of nature by religion is, I think, not the, not the smallest of the indictments against it. You still hear at times like Katrina or the, or the Pacific tsunami, you will still hear men of religion, including in civilized and advanced and educated countries such as, the, such as England. The, the bishops saying, this is because of sin, that there is an inundation. And out of this, it seems to me again, we must teach ourselves uh, as developed humans, evolving humans to grow. There are essentially two choices once we've got past the fearful childhood of our species and, and the terror with which we had to face reality in those days. We can either say of ourselves and to ourselves that we are here because of a divine design, or we can admit that we are here because of processes we don't fully understand, but that are cosmological in the first instance, the Big Bang. And um, Darwinian, to give it a shorthand, the consequence of evolution by natural selection and random mutation in the second. Now, it's an interesting thing that religion now wants, having fought very strongly against cosmology, uh, having fought against any, any discovery that threatened the idea of a man and God-centered uh, Earth that was itself the center of the solar system, that was itself the center of the universe, and having fought very hard and, and still fighting against the idea of evolution by natural selection. The great thing about being religious is this. When the evidence against you becomes overwhelming, and you can see the amazing intricacies of the Big Bang and the extraordinary uh, matter of the Hubble red light shift and the things we can now see through uh, Mr. Hubble's telescope. And when you see the extraordinary variety of species, religion says, ah, oh, come to think of it, that is true. In fact, it shows that God was even more ingenious than we had thought him in the first place. What's my objection to this kind of argument? Well, the, of, of the many I could make, the first is simply this. It's completely impossible to refute. Because every time any new evidence comes to light, it's, all, it's claimed for, well, we, it fits with what 
with the, with the unoverthrowable theory that we already had. Uh, some of you will have been taught already, I hope, that, that uh, a theory that can be described as unfalsifiable is to that extent a very weak theory. And that seems to me to apply with overwhelming force to the religious or, or, or godly explanation of our presence here and the natural phenomena um, around us. I'm also, I can imagine, a little pressed for time. Can you give me a rough idea? Okay, that's not long. I'm going to be very quick and say what I've been implying and I was going to lead up to a bit more uh, slowly, which is that this, uh, this um, referring upwards of these questions, these questions of responsibility, of freedom, of inquiry, um, this referring upwards of them all the time to a celestial authority is, in my opinion, as well as futile intellectually, uh, potentially very sinister, because what it suggests is that we are governed by a kind of celestial dictatorship, by an unanswerable to, unchangeable authority in the sky that can watch us, keep us under permanent surveillance, keep us permanently un under, uh, under watch, can convict us of thought crime, can guard us while we sleep, and that carries on this process of surveillance and supervision even after we are dead. It seems to me this would be a horrible thing if it were true. It, it, would be, it would be worse than any known tyranny has ever been. But that in itself puts me in mind of something, which is that most of the tyrannies under which humans have labored in the past and continue to labor under in the present have in their essence been theocratic. Because once you can give to any other group of mammals and primates, any other group of humans who are essentially no better than you, the right to say that they speak in God's name, that they know God's will, that they have God's authority and God's permission, then there is no limit to the kind of totalitarian misery that can be inflicted on you um, in the real world, in the very few years of existence and life and potential freedom that we absolutely know for a sure thing we do have, that are not part of the metaphysic, but that are our common property, are our birthright. And this has been true since the, the, early, uh, the early theocratic tyrannies of the Aztecs, the Babylonians, through to the idea of the tyrannies of feudalism and monarchism against which the American Revolution was mounted, to many, many of the terrible 20th century tyrannies, fascism, Hitlerism, the South African system of apartheid, which was a, a branch entirely of the Dutch uh, Reformed Church and its belief that there was a divine mission on their side, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is shortly to get its own apocalyptic and Armageddon weapon, and other threats which make me think, and I'll, I'll rest my case here and wait for rebuttal, make me think that the battle against the religious illusion is part of a very important battle, not just for human emancipation, but actually potentially, if not really imminently, uh, also for human survival, and therefore a battle that we dare not lose. Thank you. I must say that in Christopher Hitchens, as you hear, as you heard, we have a, a formidable um, advocate for atheism. I think one made even more formidable by his impressive Richard Burton accent. Um, I do want to begin by um, challenging a couple of the specific claims that he made, because I think that in these debates, we're all entitled to our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. He began by saying uh, that he challenged um, Christians, or anyone, to state a premise from within religion that is exclusive to Christianity that would not be, or could not be, advocated, I suppose, consistently, or in reason, by an atheist. Uh, and I have an answer for that. It's simply Christ's principle or injunction to love your enemy. Now, obviously, any atheist can say that, but it makes absolutely no evolutionary sense. The whole point of evolution is to wipe out your enemy, who is a threat to your survival 
and the perpetuation of your genes. Yes, you might make temporary bargains with people for your own gain, but the idea of universal brotherhood, of taking care of the stranger, of pure altruism, of loving even those who intend you harm, this is a doctrine that I have never heard an atheist advocate, and I don't think anyone in good conscience could. Christopher Hitchens also said that um, suicide bombing is a religious um, patent, and that is actually not true. The most notable of the suicide bombers of the last century were the Japanese kamikazes, who were doing it not for religious reasons at all, but because of political dedication to the emperor, and uh, you may say a kind of Japanese chauvinism and nationalism to win the war. It had nothing to do with religion. The Tamil Tigers, who are the inventors of the modern form of suicide bombing, happen to be Hindu, but their suicide bombing has nothing to do with that. It's ultimately driven by nationalism and tactical moves in a way to gain territory and power. So an attempt to simply take these actions and ascribe religious motives, even when none are present, I think is a little bit dubious. Even if you look at religious conflicts around the world, The Hindus and the Muslims aren't really fighting about religion. They're fighting about Kashmir. The Israelis and Palestinians aren't really fighting about God. They're fighting about land. So there's an effort here to blame religion for things that often have little or nothing to do with it. Then Christopher Hitchens gave a very memorable example of uh, his teacher talking about why we like green stuff uh, like uh, pastures and blue stuff like oceans. Uh, And his own ingenious observation is that we have adapted to nature, not nature to us. In those two rather pathetic examples, I think his logic holds. But if you go further, you see that his teacher's argument is completely valid. Let's say his teacher would have framed it somewhat differently. Not that we happen to like green pastures, but aren't we fortunate to live on a planet where the sun is eight light minutes away? If the sun happened to be further away it would be too cold to sustain life. If the sun happened to be a little bit closer, we would scorch to death. Or isn't it lucky that in our constellation we have a large planet strategically placed like Jupiter, which vacuums up wandering asteroids and meteors and prevents large lethal objects from hitting the Earth? This is a a whole scientific literature on this. Now, this has nothing to do with Darwinian selection. It is simply ludicrous to say that the evolution, that because the, the dog and the wolf has a common ancestor, it has nothing to do with that. We're talking about the conditions that made evolution itself possible, the conditions that make it possible for life itself to exist on this earth. And then if you say, well, we just happen to live on a lucky planet, no big deal. There are billions of planets and stars out there. The truth of it is, the universe requires certain numerical constants for life to exist. Uh, The physicist Stephen Hawking, in his book, A Brief History of Time, gives one very revealing example. He says that if the rate of expansion of the universe from the time of the Big Bang differed, not by 10% or 1%, but one part in a hundred thousand millionth million, we would have no universe we would have no life. This is an argument for design at a completely different level than Christopher Hitchens' well-meaning English teacher. It's an argument that says that not just our planet, but the entire universe has to be as big as it is and as old as it is in order for us to be here having this conversation. This, I think, is an argument that needs to be answered, and I'll wait to see whether it is. I want to make a final point in my time about my own time. My time is up. Thank you very much. Eight minutes. Yeah. Mr. Hitchens will have eight minutes, timekeepers. Okay, well, I'll do, it, I'll do it directly because this is starting to be fun. Um, I don't want to change the goalposts, of course, but I don't actually think that loving your enemy is always a moral injunction. Um, there are some enemies I don't love and I don't think I should. I, it's not my right for people who might want to kill you and your children or kill my children. It's not my right to love these people. It's my duty to destroy them, to defeat them. And there's nothing moral about saying, let them have their way, turn the other cheek. That would simply be uh, my political, my secular, rather than my, my theological 
view, but I do think there is a problem with, with the rest of what Dinesh said on this point. Um, the, the other injunctions about love, and we, we'll stay just with Christianity for the moment. A problem I always had with it was, was compulsory love. Not you're compelled to love your neighbor, or even not just to love him, but to remember to love him or her as you love yourself. An injunction that actually cannot be obeyed. Nobody with any integrity and self-respect can have the same regard for another person as he has for himself and perhaps his family. It's not to be expected. It's more than can be demanded. It's a work of super erogation. And it has the sinister corollary that because you know you can never quite do it, you're always falling short. You must always flagellate yourself for failing to come up to this magnificent idea. You're always going to be guilty again. You can't possibly be right. You're always in a state of sin. And this has the connotation again uh, of the totalitarian, a, a, a law you cannot obey. Further, you're supposed to return this love to someone who is your creator. And you're told in addition to being compelled to love this person, you must also fear him. Is there not a problematic element here? Compulsory love for a being, a supreme being, of whom he must also at all times always be in fear. When I think of this, the image I get is of George Orwell's Big Brother in 1984, where adoration is extracted from people who are in a state of holy terror. It doesn't seem like morality to me. Now, the golden, the so-called golden rule um, that we should have the same consideration for others that we expect them to have for us is a very fine rule in its way. It has a limitation I'm about to mention, it's a, but it's a decent enough rule. And, it long pre and it's not hysterical, and it's not totalitarian, and it doesn't demand the impossible of people. Don't do to another what would, be, what would be repulsive if they did it to you. We know that that was said by Rabbi Hillel long before Christianity, Babylonian rabbi. Something almost exactly in that form of words also appears in the Analects of Confucius. So it predates monotheism altogether. Some such idea is obviously innate to us. It's commonsensical. The limitation, I'll just mention it conversationally, is it's a rule that's only really as good as the person who's uttering it. The person who's uttering it must be a person of average moral character because there are many people, uh, I'll, let me think of an example. Well, Ch Charles Manson, for example. It, it's ludicrous for me to say of him that I don't want anything done to him I wouldn't want done to myself. Obviously, I want different things to happen to Charles Manson. I don't judge it by what I think I'm entitled to. So the rule is in danger of becoming tautologous and of breaking down. And that's why I don't think that there are, in that sense, religious or moral absolutes. Um, and why it's, it never makes any sense to say that we wouldn't know right from wrong if we couldn't refer it upwards to the unseen celestial court. There will always, unfortunately, be uh, ethical and moral approximations. And that's part of the curse of our mammalian condition. Now, I, did not, I deliberately did not say that suicide bombing, I think the record will show, was an exclusively religious monopoly. I said it was almost exclusively a religious monopoly because I know myself about the Tamil Tigers. And I agree with what Dinesh said about that. I said the genital mutilation of infants community was exclusively religious. Um, but if I'd been going to make an exception on the suicide murder and suicide bombing one, I wouldn't have chosen the Japanese kamikaze. After all, their emperor was a god in Japan. Japan was one of the most completely theocratic of the three uh, countries that made up the Nazi fascist axis. The emperor was, until he renounced his divinity rather conveniently in 1945, um, a, a god. So anyone committing a kamikaze action was doing it to please the, div the divinity. Just a, a point I don't think that is negligible. How much time do I have about Jupiter protecting us from meteors? Oh, that's all right. Um, well, we wouldn't be here if meteors didn't come smashing into the Earth at re fairly regular intervals. It's, it's almost certainly only because of a titanic uh, meteor strike, probably on the Yucatan Peninsula, that the dinosaurs got out of the way and the hitherto small, squeaking, frightened mammals that had been under their hoofs uh, were able to evolve a bit and um, get on with the becoming a human. But if you're going to say that, these, that, that, that physics and evolution are evidence of some uh, divine design, um, here are some of the difficulties that you're going to have to face. First, whether or not there used to be nothing and there's now something, and that something is the miracle, 
However we resolve that, we do know one thing for absolutely sure. Our something is very soon going to be replaced by nothing. Um, the Hubble red light shift, uh, if some of you will know about it, uh, used to postulate that the, the Big Bang means that uh, we're exploding away faster uh, than we had thought um, from the original source. The matter is flying apart. The observable universe is flying apart much more quickly than we had thought. It was then thought for Newtonian reasons, well, that's going to slow down. The rate, at least, will slow down. The recent discoveries by a great physicist named Lawrence Krauss have shown, to the contrary, the rate, the rate of expansion is actually increasing. In other words, very, very, very soon, it won't be even possible to, to detect the red light shift anymore. So a lot of nothingness is coming our way, and if that wasn't enough, the Andromeda galaxy, which can be seen almost by the naked eye in the night sky now, is headed directly on collision course with our own. Uh, that's some design, isn't it? Um, of taking our own tiny little suburb of this magnificent uh, cosmological city, our negligible little suburb, just our solar system, um, for an example, of all the planets in it, all of them but ours, are either much, much, much too hot or much, much, much too cold to support any kind of life. And of our own planet, huge tracts of it, the same can be said, either too hot or too cold and on a, on a knife edge. And we've only been on it for about 100,000 years minimum, 250,000 years maximum, and our time, our tenancy on it can already be seen to be very short term. And in the meantime, we've discovered that of all the species ever put on this planet, um, or to have occurred on it, I mean to say, 98 to 99% have already become extinct. So if, the, if, if all of the things I've just mentioned to you, all of which are true and factually verifiable, are the responsibility of a deity, then there's only one conclusion you can draw. This deity must be very, very clumsy, very tinkering, very improvising, and very, very wasteful of cosmic and human and animal material, at least. He must be very, very capricious, very capricious indeed, uh, playing and toying with his creatures and his creations, uh, and or he must be very cruel and very indifferent. So if you want to award these responsibilities uh, to your God or to your religion, then I, I'm entitled, I think, to wish you joy of it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we begin now the 15-minute head-to-head session, and uh, Mr. Hitchens will begin uh, uh, by questioning Mr. D'Souza. Oh, I thought it was the other way around. Uh, I believe we, l we let him start first, so we're letting you start the head-to-head -head okay. first. I was about to say I'm not ready, but that's not quite true. Do you want me to go first? No, no, it's perfectly all right. Okay. Um, wouldn't you say that we, uh, well-matched as we are as chaps and as magnificent mammals, um, either products of evolution or of a creator, that we, our, our position on this stage isn't precisely equivalent. In other words, you couldn't really resent it if I said, you've got a burden of proof that I don't really have. Because it's not just a matter, is it, of saying there might be a force, a life force, an originating force, um, which I can't obviously disprove. But you have to show that there's a force that actually cares about humans, intervenes in human affairs, uh, cares which country wins a war, perhaps, or even which party wins an election, who knows, but, but perhaps answers prayers, but takes an interest. In other words, the, 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 there's a big gap between deism, the idea of a god, and theism, the idea of a religion that can propitiate a god and can know what he wants of us. Well, I, I would agree, in part as upholding the affirmative in any debate, what's so great about God, I need to show what's great about God. Now, it's true that our topic is huge, and if you want to go into issues of why there's suffering in the world, or why do we believe in the Christian God, why Jesus and not, say, Baal or Allah or Krishna, then we've got to go into each topic, uh, but it's gonna, it's, they are a little far afield, perhaps, for this debate, although I'm happy to jump into them. So I won't assume the burden of proving all those things I'll assume the burden of proving the resolution of what's great about God, and then if you want to, to pick particular aspects of it, I think we'll have to engage on those specifically. Well, I, mean, I mean to say, perhaps I'll try and rephrase it a little, that 
Um, I've, I see no reason to believe in the existence of any supernatural dimension, either cosmologically or, or on Earth or in human life. I can, I can live without it, and in fact, I think everyone does live without it, whether they believe in it or not. You clearly don't think that, but you also think that uh, salvation is attainable by this. It's not just a matter of proving that there might be a supernatural dimension, but that if you believe in it in the right way, your sins can be forgiven, you can be saved, and you can have an afterlife, a blissful one, that will go on forever. Now, don't you think that's quite a high burden of proof? Yes, but I think that a lot of those things flow out of the premise of God. For example, there are a lot of things unbelievable in themselves that are completely believable if you posit God. For example, miracles are, if someone were to tell me, I know a way to make my hand grow twice as long, I would say that's preposterous. On the other hand, if he told me that there is an all-powerful, omnipotent, supernatural being ruling the universe, and if I pray to him, he has the power to make my hand grow long, that becomes less unbelievable, doesn't it? Not to me, no. No, because, well, but, but once you concede the premise, if you, if you thought no, there no, was a supernatural being, you don't think he could do it. No, but, but, I mean, but both claims are equally absurd. No, but right. So then, then you're, you're essentially giving me a false burden because you're saying, Dinesh, not only do you have to prove the existence of God, you've got to prove these ten other things, even though if I prove the first thing, all the other nine would logically follow. You may not accept the first one, but you can't pretend like I need independent proofs of the other nine. Well, no, I just, I'm just simply saying I don't think theism does follow from deism. In other words, you get to the point which uh, Spinoza arrived at and Einstein arrived at and many other scientists and philosophers have arrived at by saying, well, there's enough harmony and majesty in all this for us not to be able to say or even want to say that there may not be a hand at work somewhere. But you can't get from that to a personal God whose mind you can know, whose will you can obey, whose help you can enjoin. Well, I would agree. You, all your, all I think, your work is still ahead of you, in other words. I think that deism is a form of theism. It is, a, it is theism light, you might say. I wouldn't put Spinoza on that category. He was more of a pantheist. Yes, uh, okay. uh, on the other hand, I think that deism does posit a supernatural creator, but somehow makes him an absentee creator. He started the, the clock, and then he stepped back. So it's a little bit of an idea of a lazy God. It's not my idea of a God. Uh, but on the other hand, deism may be one way to start on a full proof of theism. Then, okay, fine. Then if, let me ask you a, a related or subsequent question. Given the number of gods that have been, you, you touched on, you even named some of them, Baal, Dagon, um, Thor, Artemis, anyone could come up with quite a long list. H.L. Mencken once got the list up to something like 10,000, the gods that we know have been worshipped. It seems to me that we have three possible alternatives. Think, let's not even say possible, thinkable alternatives. One, that all of these are false. In other words, that the proposition, um, God made man in his own image, is exactly the wrong way around. Instead, men made many gods in their own image. Um, so either they're all false or they're all true, which, as I say, is only just thinkable because it's obviously nonsensical, or only one of them is true. And actually, if you chose that to be Christianity, you'd have to say, if you're a real Christian, it seems to me only one version of that Christianity is true because many of those are mutually incompatible. Now, do you really think, given the odds and given the scope and the scale of it, that the third answer can be the correct one? Not only do I think it can be, I think that you can give reasonable grounds why it is. See, I think the, I think the strength of this argument is, can, or the lack of strength of it, can easily be seen uh, by purposes of an analogy. If I were to say, if we look at the ancient world, you have a number of philosophers, Thales, who thinks everything is made of water, and Heraclitus, and Parmenides, and Democritus, who thinks you have atoms. And just because we've, we've got all these competing rival theories it's probable that none of them are right, and there really isn't a theory that is right. Well, it turns out that Democritus was the closest. His atomic theory, actually, looking at it, making allowances for the difference of time and, 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 and era, it, it's not that because you've got many theories, one is bound to be wrong. In fact, you could say that because all these religions represent human efforts to reach the supernatural, the fact that you've got so many efforts shows 
that it's quite likely that some efforts are closer than others. It's sort of like a, a way of saying, we're all trying to get up to the light up there. There are going to be different attempts, different uh, theories for how to do it, uh, but, but some of them may approximate better than others. But, uh, Ginesh, and one surely, might actually be the closest. But surely that's not really an analogy between conflicting accounts of observable natural phenomena. Right? He's saying... Where, where, what, what are the constituent elements of matter? We can see that nature is here. Is it all water? Is it all air? Is it phlogiston? Is it atoms? That's completely different from saying, whose god are you going to worship? And by the way, scientists do not kill each other for getting, uh, diff- coming up with different interpretations, nor do they sentence other people to eternal paradise or torment for getting it right or wrong. Religion is something else than an opinion. I hope you'll agree. It is, but let's... It's let's, a faith. Let, let's look at that. It's if, a faith with a big promise attached to it. I, don't, I wouldn't say that exactly. Here's why. Let's say, that, let's say that you've got a human level over here, which is to say the level of terrestrial man. <clears throat> let's say that we have a divine level, which is perfection, perfect beauty, perfect goodness, perfect truth over here. I would say that the Eastern religions are trying to cross this huge chasm by diagnosing a problem. And the problem is essentially the word that we begin our sentences with, I, I. So if you can get rid of the self, the idea is, then you can achieve nirvana, liberation. Now that is not faith, that is actually a specific moral remedy for a specific human problem. Judaism and Islam have a different remedy. Here is the human level, here is the divine level, here are a set of codes and commandments and diets and regulations, pray five times a day, look in the direction of Mecca, observe Ramadan, and this ladder will take you human step by step to God. Christianity says no, this is a noble effort but it's not going to work because the gap is too large. If it's going to be closed, God has to close it. This guy up here has got to come down to the human level, that's the only way to bridge the chasm. Now, again, I have an appeal to scripture, I have an appeal to faith. If you agree that I've given a reasonable approximation of the human problem, you can just assess, this is the Eastern solution, this is the Islamic and Jewish solution, this is the Christian solution, which one seems to make the most sense? Well, you did begin by a self-denying ordinance and say you weren't going to postulate revelation. But if I you're didn't going appeal to, the, to revelation. No, but you, would, your model just now would, would necessitate that, wouldn't it? And say, no, you're not building up to God, God is coming down to you. That must mean a revelation in in the sense of an intervention. No, but Christopher, my point is, I'm not appealing to revelation as a source of authority. What I was trying to say here is there are three competing explanations, and one of them is going to make human, intellectual, and experiential sense. So I wasn't appealing to revelation in that sense. But you would agree, wouldn't you? I think you'd have to agree that to... anyone Anyone is entitled to say that all three of those would be false. Well, of course you could, but you could reject the premise that there is a way to cross the chasm, and that would be the atheist position. So that would be a way of saying, no, we've got to live at level down here. There's just no way. This is simply a hocus-pocus level. This de- pure perfection and beauty is a myth. We essentially, this is the way we are where Darwinian primates get used to it. That would be a fourth position. So um, tell I, me... I can, almost, I can almost see, people, see why people hold it when I hear you uh, talk. Um, listen, because we are doing God, not just Christianity, and I, I guess I've, I've probably only got about one or two questions left, and it's a matter of the majesty and grandeur of religion and God in general that we're talking about. Let me ask you this. If I was um, being born today in um, Saudi Arabia, would you rather that I became an atheist baby or a Wahhabi Muslim baby? This is a, this is a, this is a, um, this is a trick question because, look, if you, if you told me that you are going to be a baby destined to be a, a sort of miniature Bin Laden, then I would rather take Christopher Hitchens over Bin Laden. Oh, thanks I, a well, lot. It wouldn't be a close call. <laughs> God, that was like pulling teeth. No, I I, I was just hesitating because I don't want to write off the entire Muslim world as potential suicide terrorists, even in the infant stage. Hey, here's a Muslim baby, but it's worth less because it's going to, you know, I think that's that's too harsh. I mean, there's a species of Islam I think we rightly fear, and I think we're on the same side of the aisle on that one. Uh, But I just didn't want to paint too broad a brush with the Muslim world. Uh, Is it my time? 
What I mean is, when your turn's over, then I'll ask you questions. Yes, yes, sure. It is, okay. Um, yes, I believe it is yours, yeah. Let me begin by clarifying a couple of things. You earlier referred to Charles Manson, and you said, I don't want us to treat Manson uh, the way I want to be treated. But I think that the moral principle involved here is the following. It's not, should we treat Manson like Hitchens, but rather, sh we should treat Manson the way we would want ourselves to be treated if we did what he did. In other words, the moral principle here is, when, when, when it says, treat others as you would wish to be treated, it's not, Manson's a murderer and I'm not, obviously treat us differently, we know that. The moral principle is, obviously, put ourselves behind a veil of ignorance, in John Rawls' terms, and say, we don't know who did it. Let's say I was the guy who did it. What punishment would, would it be just to impose on me? Life in prison, the death penalty? Well, okay, it's not me, it's Manson. Give him that. So that's a way, ultimately, of applying, you might say, a neutral rule. Uh, so do you agree that the Manson analogy was flawed in that well, sense? Then, well, then it would be, Janesh, it would be a different rule. The rule is, do not do to another what you would not want done to yourself. I'm saying, in that, I, do, I quite agree, by the way, with your Rawlsian take, but that's evolved without any reference to any injunction about a golden rule. You spoke about compulsory love. Yes. But isn't the lesson of the book of Genesis... And isn't the core principle of Christianity that God offers his love to us? Christ died for our sins, but there's nothing compulsory about it. It's completely a free choice. You have a free choice. No one's forcing you. You've chosen to reject it, but nobody made you. Well, you can, you can of course, you're, one, you're free to reject it. But I'm here to illustrate that point to the best of my ability. But in a very large number of times and places the price of rejecting it, or even of seeming to reject it, has been very high. And not just in the sense of eternal punishment after death, but extreme punishment and persecution during the only life one actually has. So I'm thankful, I'm very grateful to you naturally for giving me uh, my manumission. Um, but I don't actually think I need your permission to be free on this point. Or the permission from the divine either. That's being unfree. It's like saying, of course there's, if you ask me, have we got free will, I, I say yes. Of course we have. We have no choice. At least I know I'm being ironic. And the irony is somewhat at my expense. But if you say, of course we have free will because the boss says we do, you've advanced the argument not at all. It's, it's analogous to that. Okay. That's the end of our head-to-head -head session. Thank you both, gentlemen. What? I thought he had 15. 15 minutes. Oh, but you know what happened? I think what ha we... We, we, we misfired a little bit in that we, we were in, in initially intending to go back and forth, but we carved the time, and, Ooh, and he took right. the bulk of it. Let me have a couple more questions, and then I'm more happy to okay, move it. I think he should, don't you? Yeah. <clears throat> Are you happy with that, Mr. Hitchens? Yes, I, I think I un, unintentionally overrun my time this time. Sorry. The, um, you mentioned the issue about... Um, Design, and you said that you've become kind of immune to arguments from design. So how do you think we got the universe? Well, the word, the term Big Bang was originally used, uh, like the term Tory and suffragette, um, as a term of abuse, as a, as a term of mockery, by Professor Fred Hoyle who is at different times, he's a great physicist in Cambridge, who at different times has been a believer and an unbeliever. But he, he thought the idea that things had begun in this way was so ludicrous that he, so he said, oh, I suppose you think it all began with some big bang. I think it was on a BBC discussion program. Right, now, but when, when, now Hoyle discovered, when, Hoyle discovered, when Hoyle acknowledged the bang, he said, I'm quoting him now, it looks like some super intellect has monkeyed with the laws of physics. Yes. I'm quoting Hoyle. Right. And you're probably familiar with the quote. Yes, well, so, he's, been, he's been both a believer and an unbeliever. I'm not a physicist at all. I'm a member of no school, as far as this goes, but I know of no physicist who seems to need any supernatural help in explaining, or, or for, let's say better understanding, because we're only grazing on the very, very lower slopes and the outer limits of knowledge at the moment, that it's at, at all time to be able to postulate that there's a supernatural intervention involved, any more than one is required for the origin of species. Though I can't disprove that there was a divine hand involved in that too. It's just that everything 
operates just as well, every analysis, every explanation, without such an assumption. Let me ask you finally about morality. You gave the example of human beings being 95% or 99% um, chimpanzee in terms of um, uh, the similarity of genes. And yet, um, in the chimpanzee world, things work a little differently than the human world. Um, you turn on the nature channel, you'll see that uh, one uh, gorilla, one ape will go into the lair of another, um, stupefy the rival with blows, uh, grab the female um, uh, chimp, uh, drag uh, her screaming and bloody to his own lair, uh, rape her, and uh, this is called the nature channel. <laughs> now, on the other hand, if you came to my house, stupefied me with blows, uh, and did this to my wife, we'd all take a little different view of the matter. If we are merely evolved primates, where did the moral or ontological leap come from that makes two creatures almost identical genetically be assessed so differently in any moral compass that either you or I would use? Well, I wasn't saying that we were equivalent, though, in the, in the, um, with our half chromosome away, actually, is what it is with the chimpanzee. I wasn't saying that postulated an equivalence, though, again, the example you've given isn't quite the one that I would have, I would have chosen. Somewhere in the world right now, uh, that's happening to a human woman. It's actually to many, quite a large number of human women, I can bet you. That's right, happened. but... And, and, for, and for the minimum 100... Thousand maximum 250,000 years we've been on the planet, it's happened a great deal. And whereas the chimpanzee uh, doesn't have a torture chamber, doesn't practice genocide, uh, doesn't make war, um, doesn't have the refinements of cruelty uh, that his senior, the senior partner does, our difference is that we are the only primates who know how to laugh we're the only ones who definitely know we're going to die. At least I, I think the evidence is pretty solid that we, we're the only ones who know that. And we're the only ones who make gods, and we're the only ones who think we can cheat death or that an exception will be made in our own case. But it seems to me that gives us more in common with primates rather than less. But the, what's in common is, our, is the behavior. Uh, the point I wanted to highlight is what's different is that in every human community, this kind of behavior would be seen as abominable. In other words, it's the moral evaluation that makes the difference. Obviously, you can find, that's why we use the term bestial conduct, uh, you will find bestial conduct uh, among human beings, but the difference is we assess it differently. You never get the idea that in the, in the, in the chimpanzee world, there's a small United Nations issuing declarations of chimpanzee rights. In fact, one of the interesting things about the debate about animal rights is that animals never seem to respect them. So the point I want to make is there is, this, there is this huge ocean between the is and the ought, and it appears to be crossed only by our species. Now, doesn't that demand some kind of recognition instead of simply saying we're also capable of more evil, we're more capable of more good, and we're more capable of more evil, and we're more capable of the moral standards to know the difference. That's, That's what makes us human. That's fine, except that I don't think I can fully share the premise. I mean, as a matter of fact, in the great state of Mississippi, not very long ago, uh, the rape and torture and bloody and cudgeling of a woman would have had the sanction of law, and indeed of religion too. But so only... it's, it's just not true to say that this difference is uh, um, a, a, any criticism of my pointing out that these are our close cousins. I'll close on this point, but it seems that your exception proves my point. The only way that human beings can do that is by excommunicating the person you do it to from the human species. So in some senses, you've got to make the other person less than human or non-human to justify doing it to them. And far from being an undermining of morality, that's a confirmation of it. Fair enough. Okay. Please ask brief questions, direct them either to Mr. Hitchens or Mr. D'Souza. Uh, when the person that you're requesting to answer your question does so, uh, the other debater will have an opportunity 
This is a question for Dinesh. You uh, mentioned the universal constants of physics about the improbability for our universe sustaining life. However, uh, I want to know your response to this. Einstein said God does not play dice, which is you're saying you're postulating an improbable universe with no denominator. In other words, it might not have been any other way. There may no, be no other possibilities for universes. So what's your response to that? Um, I'll, friend, I'll restate the question. The question is, uh, hey, you've been talking about all these great coincidences, the so-called uh, fine-tuning of the universe, but wasn't, didn't the great authority Einstein say God does not play dice with the universe, and isn't Einstein's um, a dictum a refutation of this notion of uh, particularity and fine-tuning? Uh, Einstein's comment about God not playing dice with the universe was made in the context of the discovery of quantum physics. Uh, Einstein refused to believe that nature could be so erratic and unpredictable uh, at the very tiny scale. Uh, and then as his life went on, Einstein had to admit that quantum physics was a, uh, a, a premise uh, that was not only as validated as the theory of relativity, but in some ways one of the most tested theories in all of physics. So Einstein was wrong. Einstein had to admit that his anxiety about quantum physics was misplaced and his refusal to believe it, one of the great mistakes of his life. So Einstein wasn't even addressing the uh, anthropic principle of the fine-tuning, but in the one context where he used the phrase, God does not play dice with the universe, it turns out God does. <laughs> Mr. Hitchens, do you care to respond? Uh, Einstein was, um, he, he tried to avoid using the word God at all. He would, he would sometimes use a sort of playful expression, the old one. And so forth. He was. He was. He tried not to personalize the question because he was so sure that you couldn't get from any speculation to a personal or intervening God. And though he was very often misrepresented on this point, if you're good enough to buy a copy of my Portable Atheist anthology available at fine bookstores everywhere, you can see uh, a very uh, exhaustive anthology of Einstein's views on this question, which were determinedly non-theistic. Okay. Thank, thanks for coming out, y'all. Um, this is also for Mr. D'Souza. I hate to overload him, but um, when you were making your rebuttal, you appealed to the uniqueness of Earth as evidence for God's existence. And I just, I, I'm kind of confused. I don't see how a supernatural explanation that doesn't rely on scientific <laughs> fact for its proof is any more likely or uh, easier or anything than, than just chance. Okay. Um. The question is, why posit a creator, why not say chance? Let me give you an analogy to illustrate my point. Let's say I enter the California State Lottery, and I win. I would say, that's chance. It's unlikely. There are a lot of people in California, but, I, but someone had to win, so I won. Now, let's say that the, that the next week I enter the Nevada State Lottery, the Utah Lottery, and the lottery in every 50 state, all the 50 states, and I win every single one. Then someone would say, well, that could be chance, but when you start multiplying the odds, human reason begins to rebel. So the point is, you ultimately, ch chance is the preferred explanation when you are dealing with events that make sense by chance. I toss a coin, and I get heads. If I toss it 100 times, I should get close to 50 heads and 50 tails. Let's say I get 99 heads. You're going to suspect I rigged the coin. You will immediately write off chance and presume design. So that's my point. Human reason operates by giving chance the benefit of the doubt, but when a coincidence becomes too big, you begin to suspect a designer. So how come 99.9% .9 of all species on Earth have been already rendered extinct? What design is that? Or would you prefer, since that's such depressing news, to attribute it to coincidence? I'm not. First of Random, all, I, I don't think... These species all, were unlucky. First of all, there are only a tiny... Uh, percentage of species through time that have developed nervous systems and at least by our understanding experience you might say pain in the sense that we understand it we're not sure a cockroach experiences pain we're not sure that an, ame an amoeba does so it's true that a lot of species have been wiped out through geological time but to pretend like this is some kind of a divine genocide I think is to misunderstand the laws of biology no I wouldn't say it was a divine genocide unless you thought it was a plant 
nothing remains to be explained if you think these events happen randomly. My point is, you're saying, you're, you think that the idea that you've got a lot of different species, one developing out of the other, you think that that refutes the idea of design, whereas to me it confirms it. If you have a few simple laws that are, you might say, not only, uh, you know, Richard Dawkins in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, says, isn't it amazing we have a watch? And then he says, nature is the blind watchmaker. And he goes on in the book to describe what could be called a watch factory, called evolution, that magically produces copies of itself, watches, and other things, which survive according to nature's laws. And so he finds a watchmaker factory, and he goes, this doesn't require explanation, this is due to chance. Wait a minute. If you have to explain a watch, you also have to explain the watchmaker factory. It's a rather ingenious device. Now, if you can say... Dawkins himself says that the original cell has more complexity than the Encyclopedia Britannica. And not even Darwin dared to suggest that the original cell has developed by evolution. Evolution presumes the existence of self-replicating cells and then tells how we can get from A to B and B to C, but it takes A for granted. So it seems to me rather unbelievable to pretend like we have somehow answered the argument for design when we are presuming extremely complex design at the beginning. Uh, yes. Well, that was real. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here and giving us this enlightening discussion. Um, my head, like many of us in the audience, is just awash with um, these interesting ideas. Um, uh, Nietzsche said famously that God was dead, and of course Freud in a later sociological work called The Future of an Illusion uh, said that like all illusions, religious belief would eventually disappear as you've pointed out, Western Europe is an example. Um, the question is to, mi to Mr. Hitchens, uh, you said that religion is a kind of vestigial holdover from our intellectual infancy. Uh, do you think that we will all eventually outgrow it? And why is the, rel the, the relinquishing of religion seem to be so slow and uneven, uh, particularly in the States? Um, a small correction. It's true Nietzsche said God uh, was dead. And it's said by some that Freud said that God was dad. Uh, but it is not true that Freud said in the future of an illusion that it would wither away. Quite to the contrary. He said it was an illusion with a future because, he said precisely, of its, its, its rootedness in wishful thinking. For as long as humans are afraid of death and believe it's possible to survive it, or might be possible, there will always be a place for religion. There, there are, Dinesh and I have had a lot of discussions about this. I, I think there's, there, is a, there is truth to that, but I think it's rather reductionist. Um, there's no reason at all to think, that because, precisely because we are, uh, only partially evolved primates, that we will get over uh, our fear of death or our need for worship and our willingness uh, to believe in gods. All I can ask people to do is one by one for themselves, to emancipate themselves from this primitive belief and for societies one by one, as many have, to put at least the theocratic phase behind them and build up a wall of separation between religion and politics. And that's what I'm here to do. If I can offer a brief thought... There is a very strong evolutionary argument against Freud. In fact, evolution is decimating a lot of what Freud had to say, but I want to deal specifically with the idea of wish fulfillment. The thing to realize is that for surviving um, organisms, it is extremely expensive to hold illusory beliefs, uh, and uh, evolution counts against them. For example, imagine the case of two rabbits. Let's call them the survivor rabbit and the eternal life rabbit. Okay, and both are being pursued, let's say, by a wolf. The survivor rabbit says, I've, uh, I've got only one life to live, run like hell. The eternal life rabbit goes, yeah, probably I should try to escape, but I've got another life waiting for me that's even better than this one. In other words, the eternal life rabbit has the illusion, which rabbit is more likely to get eaten? The point being here that evolution says that religion is expensive. Even in ancient times when people had less, they built uh, pyramids and cathedrals and put the best calf and the best food away for the gods. This is non-Darwinian behavior. Those kinds of people should be expected to be wiped out from the gene pool, but they aren't. 
In fact, religion has a better survival value than atheism. That's, where there are lot, that's why there are a lot more Christians in the country than atheists. Uh, so, the point here being that the argument against Freud isn't just that illusions automatically die, but rather that illusions make no Darwinian sense when they are this costly, and Freud needs to come up with a better explanation. It's ingenious, but it doesn't allow for the retarding effect upon human civilization of superstition, slavery, genocide, human sacrifice, religious warfare, uh, resistance to scientific um, and medical advance, and so forth, all of which can be uh, chalked up uh, with a great deal more accuracy, I might add, to the religious worldview. Okay. And which now, now that we're about to reach the point where apocalyptic weaponry is within the grasp of messianic parties and states, um, it, it may find that it's uh, extremely counter-survival um, in, a, in a very alarming and immediate sense. Next so. question. Um, my question is for Mr. D'Souza. And I'd prefer if you didn't go into a deep philosophical explanation, but just answered um, the I'll simple... I'll try to give you the, a shallow one. The simple, ex, just the simple, ex, well, the simple example, you I just would like that. you to answer without, you know, going too deep, but why doesn't God heal amputees? Why doesn't God do what? Heal amputees. Why do people survive cancer but not regrow with limbs? Why doesn't God heal amputees? I think the... This is a question that, you might say, presumes unbelievable... Christopher protested against it earlier, but it's unbelievable human arrogance. The human arrogance is this, that God is a kind of cosmic bellhop whose job it is ultimately to remedy all our sufferings. Maybe God created a universe which has many goods. Maybe God created a multiplicity of creatures which are, in some senses, good in themselves. Maybe human beings are part of those goods, but also subject to the same natural laws that affect the universe, so that earthquakes, tsunamis, natural disasters, as human evil that's the product of free will. Maybe God's plan is ultimately providential. It concerns salvation, your soul, the next life. So even if God were to grow back your limb, you're still going to die. And what good is that going to do if you've got a long limb, but ultimately you die separated from God? So you may say that God has perhaps a little bit of better priorities than we do. Genius. Next, next question. It in your earlier, um, in your first speech, that Christianity, the hypothesis of Christianity, is void because we change our story, so to say. Um, isn't that? The main, one of the main corollaries of the scientific method that you change your theories with new data and adapt it so that it fits the evidence and not the other way around? I'm not sure I got the first part of your question. Yes, of course, it, that's the scientific method is to, is to be always in doubt and to be always uh, willing to test your own assumptions against new evidence. But that's completely different from the affirmation of faith. The affirmation of faith is a presupposition. Um, it used to be, I, used, I used to sit and listen to it being said, in order to believe, you must, you must have faith in order to believe. The, the, there is nothing you could tell me in advance that, would, that if, it, if I could show it to you, would destroy your faith. It's, it's evidence proof in that case. You couldn't have a bigger discrepancy between two ways of looking at the world than the religious and the scientific one. Let, let me support your point a little different way, though. I think what, what, I think what she's trying to say, and, and I would agree with her completely, is that we always talk about scientific progress. We judge science by its latest and most spectacular advances. We judge religion by, you may say, its oldest and crudest interpretations. And so we don't concede religion the chance to progress like science. I mean, I could attack science by saying, let's look at those early scientists who, when people got sick, would cut them open and start bleeding them to death. Let's look at the ridiculous theories of people like Thales, uh, who lived uh, in the 5th or 6th century before Christ, and that would be an indictment against science. You'd say, no, let's judge science by its best guy. Let's put up Einstein. But when it comes to religion, you don't concede the same progress, and it's quite possible that a religious principle, let's say the story of the Good Samaritan, the principle of help your neighbor, which is interpreted rather narrowly in ancient Israel, it means that the Samaritan uh, helps somebody outside his own tribe, but then through the centuries and through Christianity, this principle is universalized, so tomorrow if there's a famine in Rwanda, that becomes my neighbor. 
Very different than what the Jews would have said in the time of the Old Testament, but it's the taking of a religious principle and, in a sense, progressively developing it through time. Scientific progress, religious progress. No, but the people... I'm sorry, I, I know I'm trespassing on the audience's time, but the scientific method is precisely to say, let's look at Thales and let's look at uh, alchemy and rubbish medicine and these other things, and gradually... Uh, overcome them and transcend them and find further and better innovations. It's not to say they weren't trying to be scientific. They were. Um, the, your analogy just doesn't hold. Now, I, you'll remember his name. I've forgotten it for the second. But the physicist who first came up with the idea of the Big Bang was a, a Catholic, a practicing Catholic at the University of Louvain in Belgium. Bernard Lemay. That's it. And he took his findings to the Pope, the Pope of the time, Pope Leo, I think, who said, I think, Your Holiness, you should know about this. And Pope Leo took it in as well, well as he could. He said, it's very impressive stuff. He said, if you like, I'll make it an article of faith. I'll say that all Catholics have to believe this. Now do you see the difference between the scientific and the religious method? I think that's the best illustration that I know. Professor Lemaitre said, actually, no, Your Holiness, I don't think that would be the, quite the way to spread the word. But there, there you go. Okay, next question. Thank you both for being here. My question is for Mr. D'Souza. If you wanted to logically demonstrate the existence of God to an 11 or 12-year-old, how would you do that? The question is, um, how, would you, how would you make the case to a 12-year-old that God exists? Um, and this is a very pertinent question since I have um, in my house a 14-year-old daughter uh, and so we all have to make this case to our children, particularly now that we live in secular culture. You can't just assume it. Um, I think that one of the best ways to show a child um, is to point to morality. Uh, because children have a very clear, undiluted, and you may say undistorted sense of right and wrong. See, when we're adults, we develop cunning rationalizations uh, to, because we want to do something that runs against morality, we try to invert the principle. Um, in other words, we become extremely and ingeniously Clintonian in a way that Christopher Hitchens would fully understand. Um, we, we try a moral inversion in which the right becomes wrong, the wrong becomes... Children don't do that. There's, in, a, in the child, you may say this sort of... The innocence of the child is, in a sense, the clear recognition of the difference. Um, and so in that sense, children hear within themselves the voice. Children are actually natural theists. You don't have to give them a proof uh, because in some senses they understand, they recognize uh, this voice within them that's not them. See, their voice is to go for the cookie jar. But there's this other voice, not them, that's saying not to. Now, what is the source of that voice? You can't say it's Darwinian. It makes no sense. That voice requires some acknowledgement and some explanation. And I'm saying the transcendent hypothesis is a better explanation than any rival one. It certainly isn't morality that we've made up. We might make up whether we want to live according to it. But to say we make up the morality itself, give me a break. It's a good statement of the case, Bajanesh, that our morality is innate to us, though, and not given. Okay, next question. I'd first like to uh, thank both of you guys for coming here. It's a pleasure. And, um, my question is for Mr. Hitchens. Um, is there a difference between the greatest conceivable being or the laws of nature and a god, one that is not sentient? And if there is none, do you support the ontological argument? I assume you're familiar with that. I got the ontological last bit. Could you speak up a little? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is there any difference between the greatest conceivable being in the ontological argument and a god that is not sentient, one that Mr. D'Souza would argue for? And if there is none, would you not support the ontological argument, which could in many cases prove the existence of God? The, the shortcoming of the ontological argument, tempting though it can be, is that it assumes we could conceive. Well, one of the shortcomings is assuming that we, we're able to conceive something than which nothing greater can be conceived. Um, it would be difficult for us, I think, to be able to stretch our minds to that limit of conception and not award sentience, because that seems to me, though again, you're always hovering on, on the verge of tautology here, greatness to us is, is in some way indissoluble from consciousness or sentience. 
this would still leave us with the problem of where the being was that had created this greatest conceivable being. It still leads you to an infinite regression. If it was any good, it would have worked by now, the ontological argument. Okay. In the interest of time, I'll, we'll move in. I have a lot to say on this argument, and, and I do in my book, but I'm going to let it go because I'd like to take more questions. Okay, next question. This question is for Mr. De Souza. Uh, but after hearing you butcher evolutionary theory with your two bunny rabbit uh, discussion, I, I wonder whether it will be on, fall on deaf, deaf ears. But uh, could I ask your opinion of relatively recent cognitive discoveries of uh, how uh, religion is hijacking normal human behavior, normal cognitive processes like love and, and fear and uh, the credulity of children, et cetera, et cetera. Do you, do you look into that from a scientific perspective? Um, so who are your sources? Uh, Pascal Boyer, uh, uh, Anderson Thompson, Heather Fisher. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with Boyer's work, so let me address that. The, um, first of all, the... Um, I want to begin by saying um, it's very easy to make an accusation. You've butchered evolutionary theory. Clearly, if I had butchered it so obviously, you'd be able to say how. But all you could do is make the allegation and then skate on as if, as if the allegation sustains itself. So I'll, I'll stick with the rabbits and move on to, to Pascal Boyer. Um, you have uh, grossly misstated Pascal Boyer's work in saying that it somehow demonstrates. I don't think he would say it demonstrates anything. Uh, it's ultimately an effort to look at the evolutionary roots of religion. Uh, and what this body of scholarship does is it argues that religion is hardwired to some degree in the human brain. Now, by the way, I, I want to point to a, 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 an aspect of this research that you should be aware of, because this is research that actually shows correlations and proves absolutely nothing. Uh, it's a little bit... In fact, the research, in a sense, was available a hundred years ago. Everybody knows that if you give someone a heavy blow to their head, they lose consciousness. And so the argument is that the brain must cause consciousness because without a brain, no consciousness. Similarly, if you find a guy who prays, you can, through uh, magnetic re resonance imaging, look and see which parts of the brain light up and you can jump to the conclusion, hey, that's the religious center in the brain. That is causing the religious experience. I want to point out that logically, there are non sequiturs buried in all this. After all, if I see a bright light and something lights up in my brain, it doesn't mean that my brain reaction is causing the light. There is an external experience that my brain is reacting to. And yet, the assumption of people who find religious node centers in the brain is that these node centers are fabricating the religious experience. So I think what's going on here is far from science demonstrating atheism. Atheism is trying to hijack itself as a premise of science. It's ultimately presuming clearly there's no external experience. So if I can find the part of the brain that lights up, Spiritually, I have proven that religion is an illusion and there's no external experience there whatsoever. Now, first of all, you know, the Declaration of Independence speaks of what it calls a decent respect of the opinions of mankind. 99% of all Homo sapiens on this planet from the beginning of time have had not only the belief in God, but in many cases the experience of God. They feel an experience of God in their lives. Can, this is all empirical data. It's experience. Can this all be written off as illusion? Oh, yeah, but I know 10 guys who claim to have seen UFOs. Yeah, but you show me 5 billion guys who have seen UFOs, and I'll be searching for them myself. In other words, once you accumulate enough observational data, you've got to take the experience seriously. So I think the question, in a sense, reveals precisely the kind of arrogance that tends to write off religious experience, pretend that science has proven things that it has far from proven, and invoke authorities who would be embarrassed to be invoked in this context. Can I just say very quickly, I, I'm very, I think you ought to be suspicious of your own uh, uh, argument here, Dinesh. The quantity theory has a, a huge dangers to it. For one thing, um, we don't know that many people who attended services uh, made worshipping noises and so forth, that they were doing so voluntarily. 
Uh, we have no means of, of establishing that. We do know what would have happened to them if they hadn't made these professions of faith, and we know what did happen to many who tried to answer, ask even the most elementary questions about it. In, in societies like our own, which are not subject to direct religious coercion, the figure for people who have some kind of belief is much more like 85 than 99 percent. A, a good number of people, not all of them stupid, are born, if you like, without the ability to uh, place themselves in a, a faith position. They just can't do it. I know because I'm one of them. It may be a deformity, a cognitive one, for all I know. I don't think that it is. But if, if we're going to argue that nature makes a lot of people uh, feel religious, which I certainly don't doubt, I think the majority of people have most of the time been at least somewhat religious, then you must concede also that there's a large minority of people for whom that is not so. Okay. And I do. Thank you. Next question. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Hitchens. Um, we have a theist and an atheist before us, um, but could it not also be stated that uh, we are all agnostic with leanings towards or against God? Well, um, Thomas Huxley, who was Darwin's great champion, um, uh, is a man I respect in many ways, and his, his famous debate with Bishop Wilberforce is an imperishable document at the Museum of Natural History in Oxford. But I, I often feel I can't thank him for inventing the word agnostic, which he did. I think what it, it, the word, it, it, I hope this is interesting to you, it, it's a product really of Darwin's own wish that his theory not be harmful to Christianity. He, he hoped very much when he first evolved it um, that the origin of species and the theory of natural selection was going to be compatible with faith. Uh, it took him a long time to decide that, it, it, at least in the form that faith then took, it, it wasn't going to be compatible. It took him a long time to go on and lose his own personal faith, which was actually for other reasons. But the word comes to us from this attempt at a, at a compromise. I, I myself, perhaps temperamentally, am, am more in favor of making a, a pretty strict choice and, and not, not avoiding or temporizing these things. I think if, if you come to the conclusion that no serious or believable or credible evidence for the existence of a supreme being, let alone a, a benign, intervening, caring one, has been adduced, I think you're really obliged to say, not that you haven't made up your mind on it, but that you don't believe it, which would be my view. Very briefly, I, I do think there are a lot of seekers, and they would fall in the agnostic category in the sense of, I don't know yet, I'm on the voyage, I want to search. I think the point that Pascal made that I was going to get it to earlier was, he said, the problem with the agnostic position is at some point it runs out of gas. And that some point is the fact of death. Ultimately, at death, all abstentions are counted as no votes. So the agnostic who, in a sense, says, I'm not going to take a position, but I'm going to live as if God did not exist, is in some senses a de facto atheist. It's a de facto atheist who's not, in a sense, admitting it. And in this sense, I think, I would agree with Christopher Hitchens, this is a rather alarming moment in the debate, a point of, of agreement. Uh, but the point, in some sense, is agnosticism, if taken as an enduring philosophical position, it's a little bit of a dodge. On some issues, uh, it's like voting. I won't vote, and I'll pretend like I have, not take, I have not favored either side. Not true. If you don't vote, your no vote does affect the outcome in that, had you voted, it would have tilted the balance this way or that. So a no vote does count, it just counts in a different way. Good. Okay, next question. Well, first of all, thank you both for coming. Oh, uh, please. You're both very great. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Hitchens, I'm going to respect you a lot, so the question is for you. Um, one of the main complaints against atheism from uh, some modern apologists and some people is that atheism is uh, hopeless. As an atheist, where can you gain uh, hope? Not freedom, but hope. And how can you grant that to uh, other atheists and potential atheists within this audience? Well, it's, the, the presumption that underlies that that question, which I'm sometimes faced with in other ways, is that if you thought there was going to be uh, a celestial dictator, uh, that, that would give you something to hope for. I fail to see why that's the case, as I've given you my reasons. I think that that would be a very bleak situation indeed, just as... Um, well, let me back up for just a, a tiny second. Um, I wouldn't say that atheism was a morally superior position, 
I wouldn't say it was a morally inferior one, certainly, but th there's a tiny edge that it might possess, and it's this. We can't be accused of wishful thinking at all. We, we will accept conclusions that may be unwelcome to us. We don't say, well, I, I, I won't believe this because if I did, it would mean I'd have to be a pessimist. I mean, that would be absurd. It would be counter-intellectual. Um, I'm not particularly delighted at the thought of my own biological annihilation, of my returning to atoms. It just doesn't delight me. My conclusion is it's the overwhelmingly probable thing, that the likelihood that I'll be reassembled and we'll have this discussion again in some theme park is vanishingly small. And if you want to... Uh, reintroduce the question of hope. No, I don't like the idea that at a certain point I'll be tapped on the shoulder and told, you have to leave the party now, and you can't come back. And not only that, it's going to go on without you. I don't particularly like that thought, but I think it will happen. On the other hand, if you replace it with the thought, the party's going to go on forever, and Daddy will be watching you at it all the time, and you can never leave, if you find hope in that, I wish you joy of it. I think, uh, just very briefly, um, I think to accept unwelcome news makes sense if it is true, but doesn't by itself give one moral credit. Because you could be accepting the unwelcome news, not because it's true, but for all kinds of other reasons. You could be a masochist. You might, as Christopher himself insinuated, not want it to be true. Because if it is true, all kinds of consequences might follow. In other words, I have a chance of going to heaven, but I might end up in hell. I would rather believe there is no heaven and hell, so I can live my life exactly as I want. I don't have to follow all these commandments and codes and so on, and I can, in a sense, abolish moral accountability. I can get rid of moral judgment if I don't have a judge. This is wishful thinking of a different sort. It's wishful thinking that we will not be held accountable for our actions. So, there are two kinds of wishful thinking involved. The wishful thinking that says, I wish I'd make it to heaven. And the wishful thinking that says, I hope there isn't any heaven because I'm having too much fun down here. Okay, which side are we on? Who's next? Your question. All right, my question is for both. The atheist looks at the universe and says, look. Step up to the mic. The atheist looks at the universe and says, look, that proves there is no God. The Christian looks at the universe and says, look, that proves there is a God. Isn't the true question, do you believe? Well, that, is, that certainly isn't the atheist position. The atheist says that the universe is explicable uh, without any uh, supernatural assumptions. The, the, the universe gives you no reason to think. Uh, nor does anything else in nature give you any reason to think there's a supernatural dimension. It doesn't prove the non-existence of God because that can't be proven. The no. Christian position... But the proof that there is is something that's been attempted by some extremely intelligent people, not exempting my friend and comrade, but there's no, no satisfactory proof has ever been or ever will be found. The... It's, it's evidence proof in any case. It's a matter of faith. In a Newtonian universe where space and time extend indefinitely, uh, infinitely, it's a little difficult to see how the universe could have had a beginning or how a god could have created it. Um, however, with the important discovery in the last century that the universe has a beginning, we have the following argument. It's not a proof, it's an argument. And it appeals to human experience. In our human experience, Everything that has a beginning has a cause. That's proposition number one. Proposition number two, a statement of fact. The universe has a beginning. Conclusion number three, the universe has a cause. Four, the cause could be natural or supernatural. Five, we rule out the natural cause since the universe includes all of nature. And we presume that nature doesn't cause itself or bring itself into existence. Therefore, there is a supernatural cause. That cause we call God. If you believe that, you believe anything. Uh, sorry, what are you signaling? <clears throat> Five minutes. Oh, fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, is a basis for any importance, any speciality, 
whether we call it rights or dignity, what makes any member of this species, you or I or anyone, special in a species that you say is a physical and biological accident and will inevitably be destroyed by the stars? This is a very familiar false antithesis, and it's based on an unexamined uh, presumption, um, which is that um, it's best put, I think, by Dostoevsky um, in The Brothers Karamazov. But without God, anything, anything goes, right? That it'd be, uh, you, you, you're awarded permission to do as you like. Nothing really matters. The lives and rights of others are unimportant without God. But wouldn't it be, I won't say um, more true, but at least as true to say that with God, all atrocities and indifferences are also thinkable, sometimes mandated. Some religions order you to enslave people. The Old Testament repeatedly orders you to do it. Um, they order you to mutilate the genitals of children. They order you to be terrified of the menstrual blood of women. They order you to inflict um, uh, rape and exile and dispossession and torture on other people. Um, you, you don't have to look far if you open your newspaper and go around the world, just do a quick tour d'horizon and see the ways in which the parties of God enjoin people to behave. In other words, I... I I absolutely reject the grammar of your question, and I also very much resent, as I've told you before, gave you fair warning on this point, very much resent the smug religious assumption that anyone who can mention God has a moral edge on me. Not so. Go back and try again. Um, yeah, Christopher, no, um, no, no follow-up question. Very briefly, I, I don't think he meant it in an accusatory way. I, I think he was asking it perhaps in, with an example... We're always told, care about the earth, look after the planet, because future generations are going to inhabit it. Now, in some sense, in the Darwinian sense, you could say, well, why should I care about future generations? What have they ever done for me? Uh, why should I? I can care about my children, but I think the earth's going to be around for them. Uh, eons down the road, if there's global warming and the planet is five degrees warmer uh, 500 years from now, who cares? Um, why should we care? Why should we invest in things that are not, of our, not to our Darwinian benefit? Um, I think this question still awaits a full answer. Uh, because the, I think a the atheists are too quick to say, we can remove God and leave morality securely in place. In fact, Nietzsche was the one who disputed that. He said, no, you think you can... The point of God is dead was not some crude assertion that God should be uh, cremated or we can't believe in God. It was, that it was the consequences of the death of God. Nietzsche was actually talking to atheists. When Zarathustra comes into the public square, the people surrounding him are not religious be believers. They're atheists. Uh, and Zarathustra says to them, you fools, you don't understand the implications of what you're saying. If God is dead, all the morality that came out of God has to go too. It can last for a little while, but over time it will erode. And Nietzsche predicted terrible wars in the 20th century that would follow the secularization of European society. And boy, was he an atheist prophet on that score. But there's a specific Christian school called premillennial dispensationalism, and it's not the only one that says, who cares about the environment? Who cares about the planet? Who minds about all this? Jesus is coming back. He's coming back real soon. You're wasting your time with conservation measures. And the mutatis mutandis, that would be just as true of any other calamity, that, that if you believed in God, you could be as indifferent to it as, as you wished. Um, who, said, who said the following about the prospect of a nuclear uh, holocaust, a nuclear extermination of humanity? Who said this about it? Uh, the, the worst it could do would be to move people more, more, than, more rapidly rather than less into a state of futurity uh, to which they're destined in any case. Wasn't me. No, it was, the Archbishop of, it was the Archbishop of Canterbury when there were first protests against Britain testing a nuclear weapon in the atmosphere. It was an ex cathedra statement by the Archbishop. It's a, perfect, a statement that's perfectly congruent with the Christian faith. Okay, we have time for one more question over here. Okay, this question is for you, Mr. Hitchens. If there is no God and no higher calling for our lives, then what is the point of life? And not only that, but how can you say that our God is cruel if he gives us a chance for eternal life and for a higher, a higher calling? Well, it's a matter of taste, I suppose. Do you find life more pointful if you regard yourself as the... As, uh, uh, 
a counter in a, in a capricious game where you might be a stillborn baby, um, you might be a baby uh, with AIDS in Africa, you might be a baby who died in childbirth or killed its mother, or you might be, live long enough to be raped and cudgeled, or you might become a, a, a Queen Cleopatra. Any of these things might happen, uh, but it was all according to a divine plan that you couldn't find, any, find out anything about. You just had to pray and hope to be lucky. Why, does that, why is that pointful? What, 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 why does that make life, why does a faith like that make your life more meaningful? It seems to me to have the very severe risk of making it much less so. I'd like to highlight two brief points. Um, one of them is we've heard a lot about how cruel God is. And it may be that in some religious interpretations, some of the Islamic ones, for example, God is presented, although admittedly as merciful at the same time, as being a pretty harsh character. Sometimes even the Old Testament God can be portrayed that way. I do think that none of this applies to Jesus. It would be ridiculous to refer to Jesus as cruel in anything he said or did. And moreover, if you look at the essence of Christianity, which is that no matter how bad you've been, no matter what you do, even if you are Charles Manson, ultimately, all that is required of you is to say yes to a sacrifice already committed. In other words, no cruelty, no recriminations. We're not going to cut your arms off or your legs off. All that you have to do is accept what Jesus did for you on the cross and that's it. What could, be a lighter, what could be a lighter requirement? It's like the Garden of Eden. It's a beautiful place. Do whatever you want. Just don't eat from this one tree. But such is the perversity of human nature that that tree we've got to go bite out of. And, and this simple Christian commandment is too much for us. God is too cruel to ask that we just say yes to a free gift. One other thought. And that is... I think when you're asking about the point of life, you're getting back at the question earlier about the practical benefits of atheism in Christianity. If something is not, none of us knows on the basis of reason alone what comes after death. In some senses, you can never fully sort out something that is inherently unknowable. It's on the other side of the curtain. Shakespeare calls death the undiscovered country. So since we don't know for sure, we've got to orient our life one way or the other. We've got to make a choice. So in some senses, the question is, which solution benefits you more? Which gives you more practical payoff? Now, if I had a, a, a child who was, let's say, killed by, by cancer, and I go to an atheist and say, what do you got for me? The atheist was basically going to say, cancer cell one, D'Souza family zero. There's no point to it. There's no meaning to it. There's no consolation I have to offer you. Ultimately, this is nature. Get used to it. On the other hand, the Christian way Deal is different. It. it at least offers me that there is a divine being superintending the universe. There might be some meaning or purpose in this, even if I don't know what it is. There's the possibility I might be reunited with my son or daughter in a future life. I may not believe all those things, but my point is if I do believe them, they're going to give me a very practical sense of benefit and hope. In that sense, Christianity delivers the goods in a way that atheism can't. Well, I sure don't. Um, I sure don't see myself visiting the family of someone who's just lost a child, and telling them that God wants it that way, and then thinking I'm morally superior for doing. That. I sure won't do that. You're quite right. And you're wrong about uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Dinesh. It seems to me there is no, there is no hell in the Old Testament. Strange but true. At least not in any of the canonical books. What does God may order a lot of genocide and enslavement and torture and rape and dispossession, but once all these people have been destroyed and had their lives and their civilizations obliterated and the earth has covered them, that's it. There's no punishment of the dead. For infinite torture, for, for torture that goes on forever, um, you have to go to the Nazarene, who says that uh, those who don't accept his gentle and meek and mild preachments can depart into everlasting fire. Again, something in me resists being spoken to in that tone of voice. Um, if we get this lady's question, we've, we'll have answered everybody's. Sure. That would be wonderful. It hardly ever happens. Well, Come I, on. Really, I really don't have a question. I oh, just kind of have a statement. I just answer um, what you had asked earlier. I do believe that something that a Christian can do 
that a non-Christian oh. atheist cannot do is to lead someone to Christ or to an eternal heaven, to salvation, to something beautiful, whereas an atheist or someone who's a non-believer can lead someone to hell and condemn them. Okay. That's all. That's all. Thank you. Comment, Mr. It doesn't quite respect the terms of the question, but I, but I'm, I appreciate the, the, the thought anyway. Okay, thank you both. Especially yeah. the thought that I'm going to hell. <laughs> A moral statement if ever I've heard one. <laughs> Let's take this opportunity to thank both of these gentlemen for being here with us tonight.